Ego Obi is a mother, a mentor, a charity worker, but she is also a technologist and head of operations for Google in sub-Saharan Africa. Ego is passionate about using her time to help people make a difference. Amongst many other things, it was a privilege to discuss the extraordinary work that her team have carried out in developing countries in recent times. We also talk about the frightening, untapped potential of sub-Saharan Africa. Ego also talks candidly about her mentoring work with women. Seldom have I learned so much from a single conversation. It was inspiring, enlightening. This one has got it all. So, Ego, thank you so much for coming on the Tech Leaders podcast. I am really excited by the prospect of talking about some of the amazing things we're going to uncover today, uh, especially uh, the work that Google have been doing in sub-Saharan Africa and other emerging markets. But before that, I just wanted to ask you to take us back to the early part of your career. Where did it all begin for you? So my my background is uh, financial accounting, so financial systems. And after university, the norm was you go to take your ACCA, the professional qualifications, and then you practice. So I my career started as a professional accountant. However, as much as I love numbers, I'm a numbers person. I also knew that I like to take things apart. So I was at PwC, actually, one of the uh, top four accounting accounting firms. I was sent to client sites on uh, financial systems implementations. But I found that I leaned more towards the system side over the accounting side. So I very quickly became the bridge between the finance team and the systems team. So my uh, my uh, preference was always to work with clients that had systems implementations. And that's really where my interest was sparked. With some of the clients, uh, we were actually implementing either Oracle Financials or actually SAP as well. So I kind of did sure. both. And then I, um, you know, I got a role uh, working with, uh, with Oracle. And that's how I kind of took the, made the leap from the finance side into, into the system side. So you were, you were drawn to the efficiency of software for exactly. being able to manage finances, essentially. Exactly, then, yeah. exactly, exactly, yes. Y- you strike me as somebody who likes to bring order to a state of chaos, is that fair to say? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you got that very quickly, uh, yes. I wanted to ask you about the coaching vine, okay? Mm-hmm. You're obviously passionate mm-hmm. about women in tech, mm-hmm. uh, women leadership, a female mm-hmm. leadership. So tell us about your thought process behind setting up that venture, Uh, And and the the key drivers for setting it up. I introduce myself as one who's passionate about making a difference, right? Using my time, talent, resources. Yeah, sure. By nature, I'm an encourager and I've always been that way. I don't know when that actually started in, in my life, but I'm always very quick to help and to give and, you know, support as much as I can. When I joined in the early days, I was, I was work, working in the city. I noticed there weren't that many women. And of course, there weren't that many uh, women of color as well in the, in the city. So the idea, of, uh, the idea of the coaching vine was really kind of born out of the fact that there weren't that many women. And with the kind of person that I was uh, wanting to, to help or give or support, I had a number of people approach me to be their mentor, both in the workplace and outside of the workplace. And people ask me questions. Oh, how did you navigate your way from this organization to the other? Or how did you grow in in your career? So that's really where it started, creating something that kind of bounces ideas or supporting people or giving advice on how to navigate either their careers or a difficult situation. An example that comes to mind is the fact that sometimes as women, we feel like we have to check every box before we take on an opportunity or a challenge. Whereas from my understanding, from what I've heard and from research with men, it's not the case. You just throw your hat in the ring anyway. So the idea behind it was to 
um, you know, to kind of support women, especially young, yeah. uh, younger women who aspire to be leaders. You know, something that I've learned over the years is to know what your brand is or know what your brand, you want your brand to be, assess where you are right now, are there gaps? What do you need to do to close those gaps? And then that then helps you build the confidence. That's inspirational. And I think um, there's some brilliant advice, brilliant pieces of advice in there as well that I'm sure will resonate with many who are listening. Mm -hmm. Just really keen to, to chat about the, the period of your career where you the opportunity came up to join Google at quite a pivotal moment not only in your career, but in the, in the, in the evolution of such a disruptive, um, trailblazing organization like Google. Talk us through that time in your life when you joined Google and, and your motivations for, for wanting to join an organization like that. As much as I say that um, I like to be intentional about, you know, things I do, decisions I make, joining Google was not intentional, right? So, you know, a recruiter got in touch. And I had a look. Of course, I knew what was happening at the time. This was in 2005. And um, I said, yeah, I could explore. And, you know, they sold it to me. And I thought, OK, in order for me to actually accept, I needed to learn a bit more about the organization. Once I joined, I realized that I made the right decision. Uh, the culture hasn't really changed. It's grown, of course, but it's kind of stayed true to its culture, which is um, that innovative mindset, you know, uh, fail and fail fast. The evolution of the culture is really centered around that innovation uh, and innovative mindset. The one thing that's kind of branded around uh, that we talk about often is focus on the user and all else will follow. We kind of, res you respect each other. You respect, it doesn't matter whether I'm a woman, whether I'm a man, whether um, I'm transgender or not. So it's really, it then helps to foster that inclusive uh, culture. I mean, nobody's quite there. I wouldn't say any organization is there a hundred percent, but with that culture and those values, it actually helps grow, grow the culture. I remember hearing that Google did this thing. This was going back a while, so it was probably mm -hmm. it was a little bit more groundbreaking then than it would okay. be now. But mm -hmm. apparently they used to give their employees like one day a week or maybe a couple of hours a week whereby they would work on their own personal project. Yeah, yeah. And that's yeah. where apparently that's where Android came from, Google Pay, and lots of other of these periphery products. Gmail was birthed out of that. It is true. So every Googler, it doesn't matter what part of the world you work in, is um, giving that time to spend 20% on their time on, on uh, it's called 20% project. So anyone yeah. can take on a 20% project. And, you know, one of the beauties of that, so I talked about the innovative mindset that actually this sure. is this is what this actually means uh you yeah. you get given time to to spend exploring something that is innovative that is of interest or it could even be a team in previous roles i've actually grown my team from 20 percenters right so somebody says you know i, I talked about leading an effort in emerging markets so all regions so middle east north africa sub-saharan africa um, yeah. Latin, Latin, uh, Latin America and uh, Asia Pacific. So I had a global team and our scope was really to bring about um, uh, internet, uh, internet access, internet infrastructure into to work with the countries within uh, these regions to bring about um, stable or robust internet infrastructure. I was, I've spent time, I've spent a number of years working in, in uh, Silicon Valley and, you know, uh, other, other parts of the world. But there are a number of people who were, let's just say maybe um, a product manager or a software engineer who is building the core products. They might have an interest or they might have an idea to build something that's specific to an emerging market. Because not all our products are optimized for different markets, right? So an engineer yeah. could have an idea to say, oh, actually, I know how I can adapt this product to suit this particular market. So they take it on as a 20% project and it becomes 
embedded in Google's core products and it's rolled out in these in these uh, in these countries. So that's what the 20% project is about. It still exists. Oh, that's fantastic. I think if there is any way to incentivize innovation and trust people to come, because people are at their best when they're trusted, aren't they? Exactly. Do you know what I mean? That's exactly. what creative, so when they've got creative autonomy, that's when great mm-hmm. things happen. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. that's demonstrable here because Gmail and, you know, other Google products changed the world, really, didn't they? Yeah, exactly. You talked about your segue into sort of systems and software mm-hmm. from the finance world, and I know you've mm-hmm. joined google looking at sort of internal applications and stuff but then you sort of moved towards we touched upon emerging markets and also mm-hmm. education as well and i know mm-hmm. you know your role moved in that direction within google let's mm-hmm. talk about that then ego and, and why did you go in that direction and tell us about some of the cool stuff you worked on over the years my career i've kind of moved in like five-year blocks in between you know so corporate engineering i did uh, several uh, roles within that after my fifth year, I was in I was in Silicon Valley at the time in Mountain View headquarters. I'd been doing the financial systems implementation for a number of years, done mergers and acquisitions, technology integrations. And I've always been passionate about the emerging markets just as a person outside of the workplace. Yeah. And I do volunteering in, in the emerging markets. At that time in 2010, I heard about Google focusing on um, emerging markets. So at that time, we actually, we didn't have any offices in the emerging markets. And someone said, oh, by the way, did you know that, um, you know, we're opening, we're opening operations or we're running an initiative in uh, emerging markets and said, oh, this, this VP is visiting. So I asked his admin, uh, executive admin to put time in his calendar. I wanted to have a chat and I met with him and I said, this is who I am. This is what I've done. This is what I'm passionate about. These are the gaps, but I know I can do it. You just need to give me the chance. He asked me about uh, like internet infrastructure. I said, here's where I tick boxes and here are the boxes I don't tick. However, I know I can do it. He had done his research because I said why I wanted to meet. And he said to me, you're very clear in, um, you know, what you want, what you know, what you don't know, and how you go about closing the gaps. And he said to me, you need to only sit in two infrastructure meetings and you will nail this. And he said, if you're willing to relocate to the region, then, you know, you would be considered for the role. And I said, yes, when? That's a confidence (laughs) booster there, isn't it? (laughs) Yeah, I said, when? Anyway, Long story short, um, he was uh, was central. The, the team was kind of centralizing Ghana in West Africa. I moved there, and our our scope was to. So, if you think about education, so education should be um, a level. It should be a level playing field for for everyone. Unfortunately, some people don't have. Some kids don't have access to the education that we have. Right. And the reason yeah. for that is barriers to access because, you know, technology has opened up the world and we've seen it's been heightened actually during the last two years, during the pandemic. A lot of people, a lot of children in the world or students in the world, regardless of age, don't have access to quality education because of the barriers to access, the, the infrastructure, internet infrastructure, affordable devices and the cost of the internet, so data. Our scope was to reduce the barriers to access, which is what I what I just mentioned, right? Our approach was to work with the regulatory bodies in these in these countries. When I say uh, markets, I mean countries. Um, you know, the regulatory bodies, the key decision makers, the policy makers, and you know, up to the presidential level. So we're saying that in order the the leaders for tomorrow are the kids who don't have access to education today. How can we remove those barriers so that the the kids or the students have access to quality education by reducing the cost of the internet and affordable devices, devices that are built for these markets, right? Over the years, we managed to reduce the, 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 the cost of coming online. I remember we go to a university and they only have one gig of bandwidth for the whole university and maybe only the vice chancellor's office had access to the internet 
the cost of one uh, a meg- megabit per second was two thousand five hundred dollars, right? Wow. W- this is something that we pay maybe. F- we pay like 10 pounds for, and then yeah. over a five year period, we brought about affordable um, internet. Uh, we worked with telcos and internet service providers. Are you talking specifically about Ghana here? Or are you talking no, about- No, 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 the whole region. The, the, the whole, the the whole, whole of, of the emerging Africa. market. No, the whole of emerging of markets. Emerging markets in general. Yes, right. Sorry, so okay. we, we were looking at 23 countries at the time. So Morocco was in there, oh. Egypt was in there, Brazil, Peru, um, you know, Ghana, Senegal, Nigeria, South Africa, Kenya. And by the time we were, because we, ha- you know, we had a reorg and, you know, things changed, the cost per megabit was $100. So it meant from wow. 2,500 to 100. So where a school would have one Mbps for the entire school, there was now like one gig and 10 gig and higher because it was now affordable. How did you bridge the hardware gap though? You know, obviously that's, you're talking about the connectivity. The idea is to build the local economy. You don't just bring everything in, right? So working with uh, local um, OEMs, equipment manufacturers, Yes. So work with them to, uh, you know, to build equipment or hardware that was suitable for those for those markets. Uh, as part of the work that we did, we had the, 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 the president actually of Mexico uh, declaring uh, Internet access as a basic human right. Wow, that's unbelievable. I mean, there must be people, you know, who, who you have cha- the stuff you were involved with there changed people's lives clearly absolutely absolutely you must be so proud of that but but let me ask you that one then Edgar. what are you most proud of in terms of the, all the stuff all the amazing stuff you've been involved with at google what, what are you most proud of i would actually say the fact that through those efforts we're actually changing lives we're bringing about um that we're bringing about sustained change there are a number of things that kind of lead up to that so we talked about affordable access for example, I mean, going from 2,500 to 100, that means more people can afford to be, onli- to be online. That was then, and now it's even gone down further because recently, um, I think it was even last week, last week we, we landed um, a subsea cable in, in Nigeria it called Equiano, and the week before it was Togo. So we're actually going down the coast of of West Africa and landing on the sea cable. By doing that, you're boosting the economy, we're boosting the economy, the ecosystem. We're actually boosting the ecosystem. We're bringing about eco- sure. economic opportunities for the ecosystem, be it small businesses, big businesses, government, education. So it's mm. a combination of things that it's just really what I'm most proud of is the impact that we've made and we continue to make and will continue yeah. to make in conjunction, of course, with the markets themselves, policymakers and uh, regulators and, and, and all of that. Sure. So, so what, in terms of like figures now in sub, sub-Saharan Africa, what percentage mm-hmm. of the population of sub-Saharan Africa would you say roughly are active internet users, are essentially online now? And, and what, what targets do you have in place? Okay, so there's 1.14 billion people in the region, yeah. in sub-Saharan Africa. Of that number, only about 300 million are online. So you can imagine the opportunity with the balance, sure. 800, 800 million. The economic opportunity there is crazy, isn't exactly, it? Exactly, exactly, exactly. One thing that I've, I've noticed or, you know, that's true about the region, about sub-Saharan Africa, is the fact that there's a huge small business or entrepreneurship population from basic things. And, you know, we have a number of efforts to uh, bring small businesses online. We have, you know, different initiatives. There's one called Hustle Academy, for example, you know, like people believing, believing in hustling in, in starting small businesses. And so there are lots of um, uh, programs to bring, bring people online. So like you said, the economic yeah. opportunity is immense. By bringing people online, it's actually ex- expanded their, their customer base. People are getting uh, clients and customers from all over the world, whereas in the past, it was really in their, in their local areas. 
So there's so much, there's so much um, opportunity uh, to be tapped into. Yeah. So what excites you most then, uh, Ego, about the, the situation in Africa? What do you think is going to be the best outcome of a more digitalized economy mm. in the sub-Saharan African nations? So I think, I think the opportunities that present themselves and the fact that so much has been achieved in the region. However, there's so much further we can go, not just us, but, you know, all the other, you know, like tech, uh, tech companies and other, um, yeah, other tech companies. There's so much that can be achieved. What I would say, though, is as much as every tech company has an agenda and is working on different areas, it all comes together as digital transformation. So what I would like yeah. to see is um, some sort of partnership where it's less about what each organization is achieving in the, in the, in the region, but more about what is the industry achieving as a collective for the benefit of the various regions all over the world. So some sort of um, consortium partnership uh, where we all bring uh, areas of expertise or we say, okay, similar to like a, a racing model, right? Where we say, you're responsible for this. This is responsible for, you know, their account. The other person is accountable. The other organization would be consulted. And then the last one would be um, informed, right? So we treat it yeah, like sure. a project, right? Um, so for me, I would say um, the opportunities are huge. The potential is there. We think about, you know, I've talked about the, the percentage of youth there. Um, so I think, yeah, the opportunities are huge. And, 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 and one thing I like about, I'm excited about is the fact that governments are also starting to realize the importance of, of technology in their respective markets. Look how much is achieved yeah. through technology during elections. It's helping with education. We have a number of programs that are actually digitizing content, creating content like app. You know, we, you know there's a program I'm aware of where we've built basic math app, which doesn't actually rely on the internet. It works offline. The opportunity is huge. I want to bring the conversation back about you, Ego, okay? Because you've obviously done some inspirational stuff. You've obviously changed people's lives. Um, what, what strikes me is you are very driven, and uh, it seems like that you were always going to have uh, you know, a successful career because you, you kind of got it inside you. I just wanted to ask you, where does that come from? Okay, so where does it come from? I, it, has to be, it has to be upbringing. I was brought up in a household that saw male children and female children as equal. And my parents kind of instilled that belief in us that whatever you set your mind to, to do, you can do it. And I remember something that my mom always used to say to me. She would say, what is worth doing at all is worth doing well. So... Yeah, sure. So I think, I think that's really where, um, you know, where it stems from. And um, there was a lot of uh, positivity in the home. I was never told, be quiet. And we had a view. We had a point of view. We had a voice. Sure. I think that's where the, my confidence actually comes from. So what, what is next for Ego then? What are you working on right now? What's around the corner? Is it, you know, is it just literally with, this, with the stuff you talked about in Africa? Or do you have other plans? What, 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 what cool stuff are you working on right now? Right now, so I've been in this, in this particular role. I've been in this role for uh, 10 months. We have this big initiative around Build for Africa. So if we think about, uh, you know, one of Google's mission is really to build for everyone. Building for yeah. everyone minus a region or is, is not building for everyone. So we have this big uh, initiative to build for Africa, which encompasses a number of things. So uh, last I think it was October last year, our um, CEO um, announced a $1 billion investment uh, over five years uh, to support digital transformation uh, in the region. Wow. So I'm actually excited about that. Part of that 
involves enabling affordable access and uh, building helpful products. I talked about the, the landing of um, Equiano, the subsea cable. So there's a lot that's coming out of that. And then the other one is really investing in uh, entrepreneurs and technologies to drive the digital transformation. So if I were to sum that up, I'm actually excited in the work that we are doing or we will do to bring about a digital transformation in all these countries. So starting there and then scaling to other places. You know, because, you know, if yeah. you think about where India was a few years ago and where they are today, I would like to be involved in that transformation. And then, you know, kind of, yeah. um, uh, you know, open, open up other uh, opportunities. You know, people ask me, how have you managed to stay at Google for so long? So I would say it's fresh. There's always something there's always something to work on, something exciting. Even if you think, oh, you know, I'm going to leave in a year. You look around and it's just that innovation is there. If I think ahead, though, I've always, I've always said to myself, I would love to work at the UN. Don't know why. I love the, I love the, the charity sector and I do a lot of work uh, with um, organizations like governmental agencies like that and, and just volunteering that I do. Um, I'm on boards of charities. And so I think the tail end of my career may be along those, along those lines. And I, I've done work with them as a, a partner, so Google partners with them. And I see some of the practices. I'm not, I'm not you know, saying you know, there's anything wrong with their practices, but I'm thinking if only certain organizations could run like, say, uh, like high tech, that would be amazing. But for me, I think yeah. I'll probably end my career in a place like that. Oh, fantastic. So let's talk a little bit about the, your sort of altruistic endeavors then. What, what kind of charitable stuff are you passionate about? What kind of charities are you involved with then? The most active one is um, I'm involved in a charity called Karimu Foundation, and it's right. really serving the entire uh, community. So uh, there's education piece. So it's taking a community and transforming the entire community. So looking at health and sanitation, looking at education, it's not just the education, uh, it's where they're educated, the buildings, and then focusing on the teachers as well. Because if you don't sort out the teachers, if you don't help the teachers, how can they help the children? Nutrition is part of it. Healthcare is part of it. So building schools, actually building physically building schools, wow. building teachers' houses, building doctors' houses, building clinics, hospitals, bringing uh, medical equipment, training yeah. teachers, so sponsoring teachers to get degrees, uh, focusing on disabled children because the culture with some, in some of these uh, uh, places, disabled kids are hidden away. So bringing about, you know, building hostels and uh, uh, for the children. Um, so it's the bringing water, clean water. Uh, so it's really touching on those things. And then in in London, I'm involved in a in a, char a youth charity that basically uh, discourages children or youth from joining gangs. You know, so providing opportunities for them through uh, sports, through music. So what, what is the name of that charity, Sariego? Um, it's called Ignite, Ignite Youth. That's, that's really unique, the Ignite Youth. I think that gang culture and gang warfare and stuff is, is a real problem in inner cities all over the UK. So Absolutely. I think that's, a really, yes, that's yes. a really unique and interesting one. Mm -hmm. I'm really keen to ask you about the, your experience of the pandemic. It's been a challenging couple of years. Uh, what, what's changed at Google and what's changed for you personally? What's changed at Google is uh, an even higher emphasis on well-being. And there are a number of things that are in place now, uh, you know, to ensure that we, you know, we take care of ourselves. I'm part of um, uh, the, the global well-being for, for the go-to-market team. Uh, we encourage uh, globally, we encourage people to have uh, mindful Mondays and uh, focus Fridays. So we have hybrid working like most people. So, you know, people are encouraged to come in three days a week for the interactions and then just pauses and just pauses in the day. Day. You know, we have yeah one day a quarter where it's a reset day. The entire organization, you take the day off. Some people may choose to work, but it's a reset day. 
and you get paid to, to, to kind of reset. So these are things that any organization can practice. But with our tools, for example, you know, Google Calendar, right? There's certain features that are now built into our tools that actually reminds you or forces you to, to, to take that time uh, for yourself. So speedy meetings, for example, you book a 30 minute meeting, it defaults to 25 minutes. It gives you five minutes. If you have back to back meetings, you have five minutes to yourself, right? Or focus time. That's a feature in Google calendar. So if you block time to do focus work, and you set it as focus time, it auto declines calendar invites. I think that's amazing. And then personally, I unfortunately was in isolation before, um, you know, before the lockdown. I was diagnosed with cancer uh, late 2019. So I was, receive I was uh, receiving chemotherapy before the lockdown. So I was kind of in isolation already anyway. What this whole time has taught me is just kind of put yourself first and nothing is that serious, really. You know, just put yourself first. If you put yourself first, I'm saying to myself now, put myself first. Then I show up as my best self to my job. And you provide more value to others then, don't you? Exactly, as well? exactly. So how can you fill others when your cup is empty? That's inspirational. I, I love that. Well, look, I mean, thank you for sharing that with us, um, Ego. So, so I always end on these short sequence of questions. So okay. I'm just curious, what if you could turn back the clock, what advice would you give to your 21-year-old self? I talked about uh, knowing your brand, either knowing your brand or know what you want your brand to be. Then looking at what will take you there, where are the gaps? And then just be focused on, on closing those gaps and being intentional. And then, you know, some of the things that I, it was almost like a, a make or break. It's not that important, you know, just live, live, just live whilst being intentional, right? Don't, I mean, of course I did, I wouldn't say I wasted my life, but, um, you know, have fun, be intentional and just kind of, you know, stay focused, know what the gap is between where you are, where you want to be and be focused on closing those gaps. And if you make a mistake, it's fine. Just course correct. Mm. Mistakes are part of the process of exactly. development, aren't they? So. Exactly, exactly. So what book or, or anecdote or story have you been inspired by in the last couple of years? In terms of books, I've read a number of books. So if you ask me that question a few months ago, it'll probably be different. Next week, you'll probably di be different. But there's a book. It's called Own the Room. I love that book. It's by a lady called Viv Groskop. G-R-O-S-K-O-P. It's such a good book. Okay. I love it. What was it about that book that, 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 sort of, um, that you enjoyed then? And what, what did you take from it? It's just, it's just kind of highlighting, um, you know, highlighting the fact that, you know, we tend to, when I say we, so women, this, this book is, is I'm sure you, it would benefit men as well. Sometimes yeah. women show up and feel inadequate. There's no need for that. Uh, you know, humans have flaws and it's just the directness of the author and just kind of pointing out things that I, I that resonate with me. And I'd be like, yes, actually, I do that sometimes. Why do I do it? So it made me question some of my approaches to speaking in a meeting or uh, dealing with people. Right. And um, it just kind of reminded me that be intentional, just be authentic. And then the other sure. thing as well is read the room. Sometimes we're yeah. in a meeting and we just are so caught up in what we're uh, uh, getting our point across. There might be other people who have something to say, but don't necessarily have the boldness to speak up. Read the room yeah. and know and just kind of pick that out. And then if it, you've had a conversation with this person outside of the meeting around that topic, encourage them to say something and say, oh, Vivian, when we spoke last week, you had something interesting to say about this point. Do you mind just sharing it? I thought it was quite profound. For me, it actually helped me think about how 
I can, as well as be more intentional about delivering my message, how can I be more intentional about giving someone else a voice or an opportunity or when they say something, acknowledge and say, you know what, that was a really good point. Uh, and then the other thing is really around how, you know, somebody might crack a joke about somebody in, in a room or in a meeting. If it doesn't sit well with me, you know, it's nice to kind of speak up for somebody else if they don't in of course in a in a professional way but speak up sure. for others and just kind of help elevate their voices sure i think it's about retaining your sort of moral compass isn't yes. it and back yes awareness back. exactly ultimately everything lots of what you're talking about ego i well everything you talk about i agree with there's an underlying theme that's coming across here and i think it's to do with confidence and, and like inner belief in yourself and this certainly comes through in your son for sure <laughs> and it certainly comes through in in the way you talk as well so um i think it's brilliant and i, I really enjoyed chatting to you okay so um Likewise. thank you so much for coming on i thank think you. so many people will get value from uh, listening to you talk um i think you've done some incredible stuff and you're an inspiration so thank you so much for coming thank on you. thanks gareth but where can people uh, find you uh, and where can they find the charities and the, the stuff you're, you're, uh, you're involved with? I'm on LinkedIn, linkedin.com forward slash Ego Obi. The consulting mentoring work that I do, I actually have a, per, uh, a, a website, egoobi.com. Perfect. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Ego. Thank you. Thank you so much. As you quite possibly have heard me mentioning in the past, we record the mass majority of our episodes at an amazing studio facility here in Cardiff at Tramshed Tech. Tramshed Tech is a collaborative community of entrepreneurs and scaling businesses geared towards supporting growth in tech, digital and creative industries across an ever-increasing collection of locations and partner locations, UK-wide and internationally. It really is the perfect place for your business to start up, scale up, accelerate or innovate. Head over to tramshedtech.co.uk or just search Tramshed Tech on your favourite social media platform.